Good morning. Beautiful day out and uh, the fact that you would be here. I'm grateful for that. And uh, hopefully it's going to be a good football game today. And Notice the color of my shirt. Okay, I have to confess. My wife is born, bred, bleeds Denver. So you already humiliated them once in this little game called the Super Bowl. So um, give them some grace, which you're known for. Take it easy on them today. Pray with me. Not for the Broncos as we get this this morning to this word. Father, we are grateful for your people, for the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and all of its glory and splendor, that new city set on a hill, the new Jerusalem, that which will one day come forth as a glorious community, adorned with all that is precious and good and true. And thank you, Lord, that we can be a part of it, that we are a part of a long line of those that have made this book called the Bible reality. We're grateful as we open it up to recognize that it's your book, that you have breathed life into it through your spirit, and we get to participate in it. That same spirit, I pray, that dwells in us and dwells in this scripture would partner and change us again, transform us. We pray that we'd have ears to hear what that spirit would say to us, that we would be different when we leave than when we came. For, Lord, it's our desire to grow and flourish and experience the blessedness that you have promised to give us. And so I pray for your church, for each one here, that they would get a smile in their heart for the way that you love them and that they would express that love in a myriad of ways in the neighborhoods in which they live. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this is a month that we've been talking about getting involved with small groups. And so we've talked about community. And a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about community having its origin in the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loving on each other, listening to each other, knowing each other, understanding each other, honoring each other, and finding rest in each other. And God enjoyed that relationship so much that he wanted to share it. And so he creates man. Let us make man in our image. And that image is an inherently, intrinsically relational image. But Adam stood there alone and God said it's not good for man to be alone. And he gave Adam, Eve. And Adam and Eve together got the opportunity to experience community in the way that God had intended. Naked and unashamed. And sin came into the picture, and it began to bring shame and fear and defense mechanisms and isolation and hiding, and that community was violated. They began to blame each other. God brought redemption to them, and then he re-engaged with his desire to build a community and called out Abram, and Abraham became the father of the faith, the father of many nations, and that nation Israel became a reality and moved by the leading of Moses. And as we see Jesus come on the scene, he too prays for the oneness that the church would experience as that community, and we see in the book of Revelation that community come as a bride adorned for her husband, Jesus, and we see God's heart for community. And then last week we saw that when we see Jesus, we see him in his glory and we see the finished work and we see this unshakable kingdom that brings us to this place of awe and thanksgiving and that that thanksgiving as a worshiping community expresses itself in the way that we love each other in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, the way that we give and bring hospitality to to the strangers, the way that we visit those who are in prison and clothe those who are naked and feed those who are hungry. 
We see community expressed in those things as we worship God in that way. And we see it in the way that we honor marriage and we honor the marriage bed and we honor sexuality as God's gift for the purpose of expressing community in the fulfillment of both that domestic mandate and that dominion mandate we saw back in Genesis 2. And then we saw it's also in the way that we handle our money and when money ceases to be our security and our significance, we begin to be a worshiping community where we put all of our trust and value in God himself. And he says, don't love money, but remember, I have said I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So be content in all that you have. I will be your helper. I will be your rescuer. And so that biblical community that God creates become a worshiping community. And this morning, I'd like to talk to us about that community in, in regards to generosity. Because if we're going to be a community, we need to be a community that is, expresses itself in generosity. God so loved the world that he gave. And a giving community is a godly community. Because it demonstrates something about the generosity and grace of God. So if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and let me give you a little backdrop here. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul writes to the Corinthians in hope of acquiring funds for them for famine relief. There has been a famine in Jerusalem, and there's all kinds of poverty and problems that result from this poverty. And so Paul begins to send letters and individuals throughout the churches of Achaia with the hope of taking up an offering. Because through that offering, Jerusalem will experience that which they need physically, but even more so, it will end up in that which can be expressed spiritually. And so Paul writes here, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 9, he says this, Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can become generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable, indescribable gift. You see how many times Paul uses that word generosity, generosity, generosity. And I think as he begins to call them to live and experience this generosity, he raises the issue of their giving. It would be really disingenuous for us to talk about spiritual transformation, biblical discipleship, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ without talking about money. It's not a popular subject, and it is one that sometimes makes uh, individuals squirm, but the truth of the matter is if you look at the Gospels, you see over and over again money getting in the way of the transformation of individuals' lives. Or money being the very thing that people look to for their security and significance, and that gets in the way of their identity in Christ. 
And it's not that dissimilar from who we are today and the reality of what it is that we depend on for retirement or anything else. Yes, we should be prudent. Yes, we should be wise. But in a culture of materialism, there's much more to be desired in, in the sense of our generosity. And so when you read in the Gospels, you see the, the young rich ruler and his inability to follow Christ because of his riches. You see the man who fills his barns and stores up for the future, his inability to trust God for the future. You see the people that rob the man on the road of Jericho to take his money. You see Jesus talking about you can't worship both God and money. You read most of the book of Luke and you see over and over again the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is in hell. He's a rich man. That's his identity. It's always interesting in the parables that oftentimes there's an individual with a name and then there's the rich man because the rich man derives his identity from his riches. And so over and over again, Jesus and the Gospels bring those stories because it's impossible to talk about spiritual transformation without addressing the issue of money. It's, it's very similar when you go into a doctor's office and you say to him, you know, I'm not really feeling that well. And he says to you, well, how's your sleeping patterns? What's your, what's your stress like? I mean, tell me a little bit about work and anything going on in your family. And it would be quite foolish for you to say, mind your own business, I'm here because I don't feel well. Because you recognize that there's connection, body, soul, and spirit in our lives, certainly body and emotions. We talk about psychosomatic uh, issues. And the reality of those things as a holistic individual is that money plays a role in our discipleship process, in our spiritual transformation. And so if we don't address that issue, we oftentimes live in a way that's disingenuous. And so when Paul writes here to these Corinthians, he's not only asking them for money, but commending them for their willingness in their lack of giving. Not lack of giving, but in the fact that they don't have much, they're very generous in their giving. And so what I want you to see here is I want you to see the impact, the results of their giving and the motive for their giving, and then ultimately the ultimate gift that we all have been recipients of. So when you think about giving, look at it. Look, let's look at the results here. In verse 12, it says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people. Now there's lots of good organizations. I was at a luncheon on Thursday the Portland Business Bureau did a luncheon around philanthropy. And there were many organizations there and companies there. And one of the astonishing things that, that I observed there was there was over the last 13 months an initial gift given of $100 million um, by the Nike Foundation and then almost another $400 million to match it so that in 13 months they raised $500 million for cancer research. And I was blown away by those numbers. And there were a number of other projects that people were involved with that were giving because giving to meet the physical needs of people is an important part of what you do, what we do, what those organizations do. Putting a roof on people's heads, putting clothe on, clothing on people's backs, putting food in people's stomachs. There's lots of organizations that do that and do that incredibly well, including the church. So the results of our giving give people life, give children food. We know about all those humanitarian uh, endeavors and all of those um, um, land developments that are good things, uh, habitat for humanity. And we see the generosity in those things, and it needs to be commended. But there's something that we can do that they cannot do. There's something that the church can participate in the art of philanthropy and generosity that no other organization can do. Because we believe something different. We don't just believe that people are physical. We believe people have an immaterial, if you will, component, a spiritual component, a soul. And that if all we ever do is feed 
the, the stomach or clothe the body. We are doing a great injustice because we believe that people are more than just the physical. Because we are about the business of answering why people exist and what it takes to make them flourish. So we are about the cause of helping people experience the generosity that comes with the gospel. And that is giving them a new identity. So that when the writer Paul says, you are new creatures in Christ, old things have passed away, behold, all things become new, we recognize that this new identity, this generosity that comes as we preach the gospel is a part of what God has called us to do. And we see the reality of that as it's changed cultures. I mean, think about it if there were no churches. Churches have been involved in the world of hospitals, in the world of education. If there are no churches in, in China with the underground church or in Romania or in, in Russia or in some of the areas of South America, the church of South America has flourished not just because the church has provided them with the physical needs that they have, but because the church has brought a message that gives them hope around having a new identity. And that new identity removes them from the caste system of India, removes them from the poverty of the slums of Bogota, Colombia, removes them in so many ways from the oppression that comes from cultures that do not understand the why. Why do we exist? We exist because we're made in the image of God and we exist to give glory to God. And the church can participate in the generosity of that message because we are the recipients of that generosity. And so when he says here, not only has the service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God people, but, he says, verse 12, is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Even goes on and says the next word, because of the service by which you approve yourselves, men will praise God. So when we give, not just to the physical, but we also give to the emotional, spiritual soul of an individual, they can rise up and do the very thing for which they've been created, to worship God. I'll give, I'll give you a, a good example. We bring people in at the Portland Rescue Mission because they're homeless, but homelessness is not about not having a roof over your head. Homelessness is about a broken relationship with God. And that broken relationship because of sin has reproduced itself through their family of origin. And because of that broken relationship, just as we saw in the garden, the, the masks and the fig leaves and the shame and the guilt has so severed, so severed their their sense of well-being that they've been hiding from other people and to overcome that they drink and they do drugs and they carry on in ways that are destructive to them. So yes, we give them homes. Yes, we give them food. But we have to heal the soul. We have to help them to understand that they're not that alcoholic. They're not that drug addict. They're not that woman who deserves to be abused. They're not that father who's left the family. They are a child of God that has an opportunity to be redeemed. And when they feel that redemption, they can rise up and praise God because the church has been generous with their message. And so when, when you read these things, it happened a, a, a number of years ago when we were doing bus ministry. This is 30 years ago. We were knocking on doors in a really rough neighborhood, and we were uh, looking for kids to pick up the next day to take to Sunday school. And I remember one day I knocked on the door, and this African-American woman came, and, and uh, older, and there was this little boy. He must have been about five years old. And, and we said, hey, do you have any kids here? And she says, yeah, well, I got my, my grandsons here, and he, here he is, and Kevin comes out, and, and uh, he says, Kevin, you want to you wanna go on the bus tomorrow and go to Sunday school? And, and the grandmother says, yeah, he can do that. And so we brought Kevin in, and, and we uh, got to know Kevin a little bit, and Kevin began to grow, and we would go in the house, and we would recognize the poverty, so, so we would sometimes bring them food, and sometimes we'd get clothing, and sometimes we would just, just love on them and hang around in the house. And we got him involved with sports, and we had a K through 12 school. So we said, "Hey, Kevin, would you like to go to our school?" And we scholarship Kevin into school, and Kevin began to grow, and we had influence on his life. And 
and, and Kevin went through our high school, and, and then Kevin went on uh, to college, and I kind of lost uh, contact with Kevin as I m- moved on. And when I was in Portland working at Western Seminary, I, one of my roles was to recruit students from Bible colleges to go to seminary. And so I started calling around, and, and uh, I called Philadelphia School of the Bible, and, and I'm on the phone. I said, I need to talk to someone who's um, involved with students and where they might be going after college. And they said, oh, you want to talk to Kevin? I said, oh, yeah, I'll talk to Kevin. And, and so I got on the phone, and I said, hi, this is Steve Stratus. And Kevin says, Pastor Stratus? Is this really you? I said, Kevin, yeah, who's this? This is Kevin Boykin. And Kevin Boykin had now become the dean, one of the deans of students at this, at this college, and, and he was flourishing. I said, Kevin, what's going on? He said, married, I have two kids. And Kevin's life was different, and he rose up to praise God. That's something the church can do in its generosity. That's not something the boys' club does. That's not some Girl Scouts do. And I'm grateful for all those organizations. But we have a message. And when that message is incorporated with that generosity that Paul is calling us to, it changes lives. To see men and women, I don't know how many times at the rescue mission when a woman is graduating or a man is graduating, one of their kids come up and there's tears in all their eyes and the kid will say, you gave me my dad back. You gave me my mom back. There's not a dry eye in the place and everybody stands up and gives praise to God. And so God calls us to this mission of generosity, of giving of our money. It takes money to make that happen. And when we we close our fists or our hands to that reality, we fail to be a part of this thing called generosity that changes lives. I read you a little bit of this um, letter last week, and I want to just read you a little bit more of it because this was written in in the year uh, 1000 and... uh, 77 or 177. And so this was written to this guy, Diognetus. I'd like to have a, a name like that. Uh, and it's written in the early church manuscripts. But it, it is one guy writing to another guy about the puzzlement he feels over these, this community of Christians. Who are these people? And the beauty of their community and the generosity of their community and the expression of their community. Have you ever stopped to wonder how the church spread like it did in a Roman, powerful, militaristic, pagan, immoral culture? God's people in community with generosity and worship made it happen. And so it's interesting, he says here, I want, to, I want to tell you about these, this group of followers of Jesus. He says, they inhabit both Greek and barbarian cities. However, things have fallen to each of them. And it is while following the customs of the natives in that land, clothing, food, and the rest of ordinary life, that they have displayed to us a wonderful and generous striking way of life. They live in their own countries, but they do so as those who are just passing through. As citizens, they participate in everything with others, yet they endure everything as if they were foreigners. Every foreign land is like their homeland to them, and every land of their birth is like a land of strangers. There's no racism, there's no nationalism, there's no arrogance or bigotry or prejudice around the country that they live in. They live as citizens of heaven, he's saying. And he says, they marry like everyone else, And they have children, but they do not destroy their offspring. This was a time, a culture where it was easy to throw your daughter because she was a girl when she was born into the river. They didn't think twice about sacrificing children. If they didn't fall in line with that which would be the benefit of the family, it was easy to dispose of that little one. And so he says they share, they, they, don't, they had a high view of life is what he, in essence he's saying. Then he says they share a common table. They were given to hospitality. They were inviting people in, but they didn't share their beds. So they had this sense of sexual purity. And when you think about it in a culture that was sexually immoral, 
Liberation came to them when monogamy and purity and reality of sexuality in the confines of God's structure became a part of their reality. We think about it today in the sexual revolution of the 60s says, wow, I'm finally free from the Victorian traditional mores of the culture. The only problem with that freedom is it's destroyed our culture, leaving all these unwanted children, the divorce rate. I told you last week, 40% of the homeless population today is women when it was only 5% in the 70s. So where's our liberation? But what they said here, they found liberation in God's plan for sexuality. It says, they are poor, yet they make many rich. They lack everything, yet they overflow in generosity towards everything. That's what people said about that community. Which begs the question, what do people say about your community? What do people say about Grace Church? If Grace Church didn't exist, would it really matter? Would it matter in Auburn? Would it matter in Federal Way? Would it matter in the greater Washington area? It's a legitimate question. Because what God calls us to is to be so beautiful, so attractive, so generous that people stand up and take notice and give praise to God. Then he tells us what the motivation is here. Notice in, in uh, this passage, in verse in verse 10, he tells us the reasons why we should be generous. First one, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. He's saying, look, God is the author of every gift. Creation is a good reason for being generous. Think about this. Can you imagine if you were born in the slums of India? You weren't. That's a gift from God. If you've traveled the world, you know that you live in the greatest country right now that exists. I mean, I've been all over the world and it never ceases to amaze me. When I get home, I want to kiss the ground when the plan lanes. I've been in, the, in those slum areas. I've been in the hearts of Africa where there are no lights. I've been where there are kids lying around with the AIDS disease. And I think of God, why was I born in America? Why do I enjoy the freedoms do I enjoy? And it makes me grateful. Creation, think about it. We take it for granted. You have freedoms that much of the world doesn't know. And by the way, you have more money than 90% of the world. And yet we sometimes fail to live our life like the gospel really makes a difference in the way that we deal with our money. Because in our materialistic culture, we depend too much on our money for our security and our significance. And then we hold it close to the vest and the world doesn't get a chance to see our beauty and rise up and praise God. So creation is a reason for giving. We take the little things for granted, but they're not so little when you see other parts of the world. But the second reason that he gives us is one that we have, and he says, because of the service, verse 13, by which you have proved yourselves men, will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Because you've been redeemed. Not just because you've been created and enjoy the benefits of God's good earth, but because you've been redeemed and in your redemption, you confess that redemption by the obedience that you show in regards to the gospel. You've been redeemed. You have all of the riches in Christ Jesus. You are complete in him. Think of what that means. You've been redeemed. And let God be true and every man a liar. Where is it that you truly get your security from? And that's why the last verse when we think about this, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. He says in the previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 9, because God has made all 
grace abound to you, because he who was rich became poor, so that you who were poor could become rich. When that redemption takes place in some of those areas of poverty, and people no longer see themselves as simply the poor, and they begin to take on this new identity in Christ, it elevates their level of confidence to get involved in their communities in such a way that it changes the world. The church has changed the world. We are the light. We are the salt. And we need to express it in our generosity so people rise up and say, they are beautiful. And the way that Paul calls the Corinthian church to do it is the way that he calls us to do it is with our money. That we would be generous with it. And we would not allow it to be that which we worship. Think about how we view the gospel. So in the Old Testament, you, I'm sure, have read the verse, heard the verse where, where Malachi says, prove me. Give me of your tithes and your offerings. And we recognize that as that old covenant where they were required, so to speak, to give 10% for the poor, for the needy, to help the, the ministry, so to speak, continue. That's under a system that was based on works and performance. We are the recipients of the gospel well, it is not built on our work or at great cost to us, but God at an infinite cost to himself through the death of his son, we have riches in Christ. So we are not living in an obligatory sense of the old covenant. We are living in the freedom of the new covenant. And we have everything we need, not on the basis of what we have done, but on the basis of what he has done. And if we don't truly grasp the difference there, then it's more about God owing us because of what we do, rather than we owing him because of what he's done. It's like with our, with our children. You, you buy your kid a, a candy bar, right? And you're, you get, get him the candy bar, you're driving down the street, and you say, hey, can, can I uh, have a bite of the candy bar? No. Well, why? It's mine. It's my candy bar. It's kind of like saying this. If I was to give you this beautiful home, 10 rooms, and I said, look, there's one room that has its own entrance and exit. I'm going to give you this house. I just want one of the rooms. Would that be unreasonable? Just to have, can I just have one of the ten? You can have the whole house. Put the, we'll put the deed in your name. But when we give the candy bar to the kid, he says, no, that's mine. And I'm afraid sometimes that's the way that we are with God. If indeed we believe the scriptures that everything we have, that's what Paul says, what do you have that you've not received? And if you've received it, why do you hold it as if it's your own and you say it's mine? No different with our money. And yet it's not unusual for all of us to experience the, the difficulty of letting it go. Now, you can either live under the obligation of the 10% in the old covenant, or you can live in the freedom of, of the new covenant that allows you not to feel like God owes you because you've been good, but that you owe God because everything you have, he's given to you. Now, the question that, that I ask is, is it, is it reasonable? If it's not reasonable, then you don't know the gospel. If it's reasonable, then how do we get to that place where we live in the freedom of generosity. And everybody has to answer that for themselves. But it certainly comes from pressing in to the heart of God and recognizing what Paul says here, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. If that's true, then it's not about 10%. It all belongs to God. 
and we figure out a way to participate. And I know some of you here probably you've got debts and you've got struggles and you have college loans and all that kind of stuff. I'm not telling you what you should give. I'm just asking you, is it reasonable to say God owns it all? And if that's true, then be generous with it and watch God do something in your life that will blow your mind. Watch him show up in ways that you never would trust him for. Because I know just from my own experience that God has been so incredibly generous to me in ways that I don't deserve. And he is exceedingly abundantly above giving me all that I, and more than I could ask or think. And yet still I clench my fist at times and say, I think it's mine. I got to do this. I got to do that. And so I, I talk to myself as much as I'm talking to you. Let's be the kind of community that is such an expression of generosity that if we weren't here, Auburn would be so much less. Because we're God's people. And if anyone could provide what people really need, it's us. Both in terms of the material and the immaterial. Because only us, and maybe it is through the platform of the material, only us can give what they need so that they can rise up and know the why of their existence. And that's when men and women rise up and give praise to God. Because now they truly are flourishing, not just with a roof on their head, not with just food in their belly, but with a heart that's filled with praise for they know the very purpose for which they are here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, make us generous people. Make us a generous community. Help us, God, to recognize that when you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, you were giving us an example of how to live our lives generously so that in our giving, we could experience receiving in ways that we could never imagine or formulate in our thinking. God, you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You have promised to clothe us and take care of us. You have promised to bless us and cause us to flourish. And you have demonstrated it in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, may your generosity be our generosity. And may we carry out this message in such a way that people give thanks to God for the fact that Grace Church is here. And we'll give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.